There you are. Good Lord, it's Friday again. I cannot believe that. Hello and welcome to this week's show. As always, post your thoughts and comments during the live show below the live stream and my guest will respond to as many as possible in the next hour. And uh, please, please hit that subscribe button, which you have been doing. I really appreciate it so you can get notified of fresh editions every week because we only want fresh shows, don't we? So let's get down to this week's show, which is going to be quite a fascinating one. I'm sure you've all read about it during the week. On October the 23rd, 1910, at the Sorbonne in Paris, Theodore Roosevelt, the US president who left office the previous year, gave what would become one of the most widely quoted speeches of his career. Here's an extract, quote, It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the do doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. End of quote. Today's guest, Michael Barnes' documentary is called Man in the Arena, which paints a visual portrait of the kind of man that Roosevelt painted in words. Michael is a lawyer, entrepreneur, licensed pilot, scuba diver, wine aficionado, lapsed photographer, soon to be novelist, and an award-winning documentarian. Michael has over three decades experience as a corporate attorney focused primarily on media, corporate, and uh, finance matters. He has been responsible for five film studio acquisitions, the acquisition of an international sports league, and almost 200 uh, major film transactions. One of his clients notes, and I quote again, from my experience, Michael Barnes surrounds himself with sharp, competent, and capable staff that share his ultra high level of discipline, passion, and smarts, close quotes. The man in the arena in Michael Barnes' documentary is Roger Ailes, the late disgraced founder of Fox News. After watching the film, I record a quote, um, well, by the civil rights lawyer Clarence Darrow, and here's yet another quote, here's a quote. I have suffered from being misunderstood, but I would have suffered a hell of a lot more if I had been understood. <laughs> Michael Barnes is in our virtual green room, and before he joins me, let's watch the trailer for Man in the arena and thank you those of you who've already joined us let us know who you are and where you are uh, in the meantime while you're thinking about who you are and where you are here's a trailer brilliant trailer for man in the arena uh let's roll tape i tend to think of it as something i've done which my critics would not have done if i were to pick the most consequential conservative of the modern era it would be roger ale and so he engineers presidencies and then he engineers the most successful news network ever. What Roger Ailes did was create somewhat of a miracle, and it's called Fox News. He was one of the most creative people anywhere in America in the news business. Love to sort of be the agitator. Roger, you are, face it, I mean, to Democrats, you're a good villain. I'm a 28-year-old former ditch digger from Ohio, and they're asking me to produce television for a presidential campaign. When Roger Ailes is on your team, you win. You know, you show me somebody who's getting the kicked out of him by everybody, and my instincts immediately are to get into that fight. People in trouble tend to come to me, and I don't run away from them. I should have died because I didn't. I could risk bigger things. I was violating him flagrantly, and I knew that I'd be a dead man. And it was Charles Manson, and I was staring right into his eyes. Whatever it is. I'll take care of it. So is he the pit bull of American politics? This is an instrumental factor in why they had such hatred for Ailes. If you get into an alley fight, it's going to get ugly. Roger has saved, I think, the First Amendment in America. I didn't always agree with what he was saying about me. On 125th Street Uptown, we say that Roger Ailes was the real deal. And they were in business to put Fox News out of business. Because maybe if you can destroy Roger Ailes, 
Maybe Fox doesn't survive beyond him. So this is all part of a masterful plan. Highly inappropriate sexual references. When she was a Fox reporter about a decade ago. Never, 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 and never. Ten years after the fact, and make you reconstruct lunchtime conversations you had. What? What is this? You know, Stalinism? I've had no opportunity to present my side on this. I am not guilty of the charges. What they called me is opinion. What I've done is on the record. I am pleased to welcome Michael Barnes to this program for the first time. Hello, Michael. Hi, Philip. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. Uh, that's, uh, that's a long trailer, and uh, it's a brilliantly put together trailer. We'll get to the trailer and the film in a minute. And uh, hello, Colin. I'm glad you got here at the beginning. You're going to enjoy this, mate. Um, let's get the elephant. I, I, I don't know. This, this is a stupid expression, but I'm going to start off with let's get the elephant out of the room right from the start of this show. I spent... Michael, I spent 25 years of my life telling people it's perfectly okay to put ice cubes in their wine or, <laughs> or just unscrew the cap and put a straw straight into the bottle. Uh, as Al Pacino might say, you've got a problem with that? <laughs> I do not. I, uh, I uh, live in Los Angeles and New Orleans, both warm climates. And uh, when people think of wine at room temperature, that doesn't mean 75 degrees. That means right. the old English rule of 60 degrees. So I, whether you're chilling wine in a bucket or putting ice in your rosé, absolutely you can do it. Now, you shouldn't. You should have prepared, but absolutely okay. That's my view. That, you know, that was always my, my philosophy that when they say room temperature, what is room temperature? Some people live, uh, you know, in the south of France. Some people live in Philadelphia or, uh, in the middle of the winter. So you produced your own wine, which I thank you for, for telling me about. And then I did a little research. Uh, it was called Republic of Malibu Beach Blonde. And you had some French winemakers blind taste at guessing which part of Burgundy it was from. Now, I know it was $22 a bottle retail. It had 91% Chardonnay and I guess about 9% of Viognier. <laughs> it came from the part of Burgundy known as Malibu. Uh, <laughs> all two acres in Malibu, California, uh, blended, I think, with something, some grapes from Santa Monica and Central Coast. But well done, you. Well, Who thank you. Who that? We had some fun. A group of uh, fellow winemakers and I all uh, had little vineyards or were making wine, oh gosh, 15, 20 years ago in Malibu and the Santa Monica Mountains. And we had a lot of fun and we ruined a lot of good grapes. <laughs> Once in a while, we got lucky. Made some good wine. Well, um, there is an analogy, I think, between filmmaking um, and, uh, and wine. I, I know some of the great winemakers have said to me, we make the wine in the cellar, it goes out, and then some magic happens. And then when we taste it again a few years later, something magical happened in the bottle. And I have a feeling that you're going to find, when we talk about your film, that, that, that down the road, as, as, you, as time drifts along, you will find that magic happened and that you didn't even notice. And you'll, you'll notice things in your film, I think, that you're going to love. That's, that's the oh, analogy I make. I, 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 and you've written a novel... Uh, which of course has a wine subplot because you you've got this 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 passion for wine. I was curious whether you wrote that while you were scuba diving off of your plane. <laughs> <laughs> I was not. Um, you know, um, I I think when we were younger, we all want to do things. Whether you're in your teens or your twenties, and you have plenty of time and plenty of horizon, and you start hobbies, you start things. And then you get busy with life 20, 30, 40 years later. And maybe if you're lucky, you picked up the scuba diving, you know, uh, uh, training or you got your pilot's license or you did this or that. And then you, as you get older as I am, you, you think back like, what do I really like to do? What do I like to do? Yeah. What did I like to do when I was 12 or 25? And it's fun to go revisit those particularly things that you spent a lot of time getting good at, whether it's golf or baseball or, you know, 
making films or making wine or drinking wine. So all of those things are really hearkening back to, uh, you know, what I like to do when I was younger and I still like to do them. Uh, and yes, I'll admit, including, you know, what we did as teenagers, we, we drank. (laughs) So (laughs) wine is just an extension of what we like to do as teenagers. And if you play it right, you can still do it when you're older. You never get too old for wine. Um, I remember the the recent. I mean, he hasn't uh, been late for too long. He, he passed away a couple of, uh, well, maybe in the last in the last year. The great Michael Baldbent told me once uh, when we were enjoying a glass of wine. He said to me, and uh, he he was well known for this statement. He says, "I I I like my my wines old and my women young." That was that was the great Michael, typical <laughs> older Brit. You yes, t- you told me, and I have to just touch on this because this is amazing. Uh, and I've got a photo I have to put up for people to see this. You, you, you're, you have uh, been very creative your whole life. When you were at school, you went out and spent. You didn't tell me this, but I figured this. You, you had a Pentax K1000. I know that it came primarily <laughs> with a 55 millimeter lens, and it was 50. It was three hundred dollars when it came out. I'm going to show people this camera because I would kill for this now. Look at that beaut, and that was serious money back in the eighties. However, from what I understand, you earned that money back very quickly from having some great photos published. I think. Thank you. I I, I wanted to pick up a hobby when I went to law school in the Bay Area, and I think I asked for that camera for my birthday, and my mom and dad. Gave that gave me that camera in September of '83 when I started law school, and you know that was expensive back then. Yeah. And so I went and joined the. I signed up to be a, a, a photographer at the local you know student paper, and then I found out that they gave you free film, and they gave you five bucks for every roll of film that you exposed and turned in. <laughs> what a bargain! So wow. guess what? I had that camera with me and I'd shoot a couple rolls a week, you know, for my walking around money. And uh, thanks, mom. Uh, thanks, dad. It, uh, it repaid itself, you know, many, many, many times in uh, those five dollar checks and thirty dollar checks from the Stanford Daily. So sure. that's that was a long time ago. And long listen, time ago. listen, Michael, with the number of siblings you've got, I, I'm amazed that your parents forked out three hundred bucks for one of them. Uh, because th- th- then they, I mean, that would come to about two and a half thousand dollars if they each, each of the siblings said, I've got to have one of those and i got to have one of those. H- how many but siblings I, you got? You got? I have six. Oh, six. Um, very so large my family, the Barnes well. family. And yeah, you you probably saw your numbers spike up because I, I sent an email out that I was doing this and they probably are tuned in from uh, Denver and South Dakota and uh, Iowa and Minnesota and uh, I ha- well, we'll find out we'll find out as they do let's talk about college a minute because because I read something that that I needed to ask you because had I gone to your school and known this I would have done this uh, you attended the University of Iowa. When you began there, Hayden Fry was brought in as a coach of the football team, the Hawkeyes. And uh, we won't get into the numbers or anything, but he did get them out of a disastrous losing streak. <laughs> Excuse me. And he employed, I think, he, he had a, a psychology background, and he employed some very impressive psychology or psychological tactics. He, he actually Absolutely. painted... Uh, the visitor's locker room pink yes. because pink. he knew the color uh, was used in institutions as a pacifier. And That's I absolutely. was thinking about that. I was thinking about you and your legal career and probably having some people that needed pacifying. Did you ever paint a room pink? Did this ever <laughs> click with you? It's a nifty idea. No, absolutely. You know, there's that. There's pacifying the opposition, which... You try to do when you're I'm a transactional lawyer, you try to keep the other side from getting too crazy. Uh, but Hayden, but I'll, I'll liken it to another thing that Hayden Fry did, which was his psychology. And people forget how good he was. We now see the swarm, which is when teams swarm together like a hive and come out of the locker room onto the field, you know, to show unity and, and acting, you know, the individuals acting as one. Right. Hayden Fry invented that. That did not exist until he came to the University of Iowa. And they're on whatever CBS or whoever was carrying the game that that week. They're like, what the heck is this? 
they appear to be, and one of the commentators said, they appear to be in a hive or a swarm. And that became a thing. And Hayden Fry was really good at that, of, of the psychology of the individuals in the team, including the opposing team. Yes. So uh, I don't know that I used any of his tactics, but uh, he was he was a genius and really turned that. The worst college football team in America was in the Rose Bowl the next year when I started. So yeah, it was I think, fun. I fun think time. I remember reading he had them all. Yeah, he had them all run out holding hats. That was that, yeah, or that, swarm together. Swarm together. Like that's couple. right. That's that's what you just said. That was that was the hive. Yeah, uh, we're going to get to the film in a minute. I just have one other. You know, I I'm fascinated with the background of my guests and how the course of their lives is slightly changed or, or slightly manipulated without them necessarily realizing it at the time. But at Stanford Law School, uh, you attended a lecture given by the future economics Nobel lawyer, Myron Scholes. Yeah. And uh, he was the co-originator of the Black Scholes options pricing model, which to me sounds extremely boring. Yet it steered you in the direction of your destiny, didn't it? It did. I, you must have deep dived somewhere on social media where I posted on his birthday. I deep dive everywhere. Sometimes I even <laughs> call people that know you because I am Inter I am fanatical about this. So, oh. uh, um, yeah. there was a yeah, there was a lecture that I took. I think it was corporate finance. If people remember back, the 1980s was the go-go 80s, where mm -hmm. you know the leverage buyouts became a thing, and I was in law school, and we all wanted to be litigators and be like the guys in the movie and this guy Myron Scholes who was in the business school as well as the law school just came in and laid down the law and it was like watching network it was like Howard Beals like I have just seen the face of something I've never seen before and he explained how the world of numbers worked with respect right. to Wall Street right. and like my jaw right now I'm like I, I can't believe I'm 23 years old and no one has ever that succinctly and it did change my my path because i became intellectually fascinated plus there i was in the wheelhouse said wow i'm in law school i can go do this for a living so it did affect my course and it was just one random lecture that he gave yeah and it it it, uh, it, it, it paid more and we're not getting into this but i know it paid more than what you got for the camera so i mean uh, ultimately so uh for the photographs <laughs> so in an email to me you said uh, I've never watched Fox or any cable channel. My making of man, in, I love this, my making of man in the arena could be superficially criticized as a teetotaler making a documentary about wine. I love that analogy. <laughs> uh, a teetotaler making a documentary about wine. How on earth, <laughs> Michael, does a human being survive without having cable TV? I mean, do you know what a smartphone is? I do. I do. <laughs> you know, it's, I, it's, I, I read a, st it's a good, thank you for the question. It, I've read that 7% of Americans don't watch pro sports. I don't watch pro sports. Um, I'll go watch a game here and there and I, I follow the saints and a few others, but, um, similarly, I just, I, maybe I was working too hard, but for whatever reason, I didn't after high school, get hooked into the network schedule by cable cutter, meaning watching network TV yeah. and then watching cable TV's regular programming. Just didn't have it. Of course, now we've got all the movie channels. I watch those. I'm, I'm not crazy. I have a TV, but I, I have no idea what's on Tuesday night on what used to be called NBC. I don't recognize, I, I don't know what MSNBC and CNN and Fox put on. It's just not my daily diet. I've seen it, of course, here and there, but um, yeah, you know something, I, guess I'm not <clears throat> I mean, this is the popcorn in the kettle black. All I watch is YouTube, and once a week since we've do, been doing this this series on this show dur during COVID, uh, which has been basically independent filmmakers, independent musical artists, and things. Uh, thanks to people like you, I get to watch a really good movies other than that i wouldn't watch movies yeah. i don't know why i feel that i should say this but i would like to say this because i guess i've had some issues over some t some periods in my life where people on social media have misunderstood things that i've said and although i don't necessarily i mean this is a this is this particular show 
uh, is entertainment and fashion. But even so, on social media, they've misunderstood me because uh, essentially it's what we're going to be talking about today. But I thought I should preface my conversation with you by, by making the following observation. And I hope you don't mind me making this. Not at all. But I'm, I want to get this just off of my chest. I, I want to point out to the audience that I didn't watch this film with a political agenda because I don't have one and I don't have one on this show. And I didn't have any intent for character assassination. I, I was watching a documentary made by a guest on this show, filled to the brim with historical footage and content. And I fully believe that you, Michael, because we have spoken prior to today's show, doing sound checks and having emails, I do believe you, Michael, made an honest film presenting fascinating information of a life lived to its fullest. So I think you can understand why I'm saying that because it, it dovetails into what we're going to be talking about. But I, I wanted to make that. You don't object to me making uh, that comment. Don't object at all. Thank you. That's a nice compliment. So um, let's begin with the obvious question, which and I, I, I tend to avoid obvious questions, but, but this one begs to be answered, which is an expression of mine, which I should stop using. Uh, uh, I, f I sound like Oliver when I say I, you know, begs. Uh, what was your fascination with Ailes and and your need to tell him your story? And I was wondering, were you in a sense taking him on as a client posthumously? You know, I that's a good way of putting it. Um, I've never thought of it that way, and I think it'll be the answer to that question will be a different answer over the next 10 years because I still kind of wonder why did I do that movie yeah you know if I knew then what I know now how much how much work it was going to be what have I done it mm. um, um, so go so many things um, it, there's a lot of answers to your questions um, what the motivations were I knew Roger I knew him tangentially um, that's a word um, it was he had you know, short version, he had uh, was thinking about leaving Fox I don't know, 10 years ago. And through a mutual contact, I happened to rep some, represent one of their correspondents as a lawyer. Um, he needed to, he wanted to kick the tires of buying another network and leaving Fox. But he knew everyone it was a very leaky world he lived in. And he needed someone in a manner to do that, that no one would ever connect who was kicking the tires with him. And I was the cut, there was a cutout and I was the guy. Now that only lasted for a few weeks, but that's how I met him. Uh, I, I met him because I was a nobody. I mean, he didn't know me. Um, and I maintained just a casual relationship with him over the years. I mean, we talk once a year or so, like, hey, how are you doing? Um, and so when he had his downfall at Fox, again, I had talked to him maybe for an hour or two over the five or 10 year period. And I, I was fascinated, like, wow, this is this is crumbling. Very, his world is crumbling very fast. And then when he passed away, um, we can get into all kinds of theories. I'll throw out the bait of the emperor's new clothes and gaslighting and, uh, you, know, you know, hovels, green grocer and all kinds of propaganda theories. But it was clear to me what was going to happen. He was going to just be skewered. And particularly, I know in defamation law, once you die, you can't be defamed. And that, that, that became a, that drew my interest. Like, wow, that's, I can see this, this car is going to slam into that brick, uh, that brick wall. Yeah. Is that a morbid fascination? Maybe, but I, I could see it happen, thinking it was going to happen and reached out to the family and, uh, Ultimately, they gave me access to his archives, and it went from there. I was I had some stop points, some break points, because if I'd learned that he was a moral monster, I wouldn't have done the film. Well, that's why I made the comment I made a few yeah. minutes ago, because I, I, I sort of... You said that to me, or, or maybe... I think you did say it directly to me, and that's what made me comfortable doing this because I didn't want to have a one-sided conversation sure. or 
I want to show, and, and there's a reason I want to show this. It'll lead into something. I want. Yeah, thank you for the uh, for giving me the opportunity to show <laughs> some clips today. I've given them all kinds of names. This one I'm calling <laughs> Provocative TV. So ah. it's first up here. Let's roll the tape. We'll be back okay. in a second after this. You owe me an apology. Your readers an apology. It was a dishonest column. But I think that I interested him because he likes provocative people on television. And that's the way it is. In the old days, it used to be, I'm the anchor man. Yes. I know the news. You don't. And please be quiet. People started to come into Fox News. And they had to say, they're not the same as all the others. And we weren't. I mean, that was Roger Ailes' game plan. Don't be the same. What I told people when Fox News started is, don't watch the competitors. Make them watch us. Good advice. Okay, so... In 1967, uh, in Britain, we, the folks of Britain, saw the transition of David Frost, who was a light-hearted chat show host, overnight become an intensely focused interrogator. And Emil Savundra, a wealthy insurance company fraudster, became the first person on UK TV uh, to encounter what we as a shot country witnessed. It became known after that point as trial by TV. A mm. court eventually found Savundra guilty, but his trial was already witnessed by the nation. Ailes was judged not only by television audiences, but also social media. And you discovered that he was subject to a gag order, so his side of the story was never told. And you also... I believe was uh, were restricted in what your film could say. So, the way I look at this, he was essentially between television and the media and and social media. He was subjected to a kangaroo court. In a in a way, um, a kangaroo court by his choosing, which is an interesting. You know, we could have a ten hour discussion upon that, but. It, my producers and I talked a lot about this conundrum or this choice that a man in the arena makes. Does a man in the arena know that he's going to die in the arena? I mean, is that the fate that you choose if you choose that you're going to be a gladiator? Gladiators don't retire to the south of France. They die. That's one argument. Alternatively, can you cheat being man in the arena and have your your seasons and then comfortably retire with your wife and kids or is that not the nature of man in the arena we talked about that a lot and what and how that applied to roger did he know that it would end badly for him I, you know i i don't know but um it's i don't think anyone could know that surely do you yeah i mean but but i just but, but his enemies would get it perhaps what i meant is if you have that vaunted position, you're a, a head quarterback, you're a political leader, you're a movie star, uh, whatever, you, 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 you're at the top of the pyramid, not going to last forever. No. There's a lot of people who want to take you off that hill. And that's what I mean by man in the arena, that if you're going to live, you know, uh, as the great Warren Zevon said, you know, be hit and hit back. Um, you're, to be the man in the arena, you're not going to necessarily win 400 seasons. At some point, you're going to be taken down. Your enemies or your competitors will take you down. That's that's what it means. You're not always going to get the Super Bowl championship. So what does that mean to be the man in the arena? It's a choice that you make. So um, I now kind of forget what your original question well, was. But I, we, was just, was I was just saying that he, he, was, he was grilled. He he was uh, he was uh, the the court of opinion and 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 the, was 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 essentially, as I alluded to the David Frost incident was done on TV, but we added the 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 other strata now of having social media sure. and 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 all the other all the other elements. Um, he I did guess, I actually go on. Go you, have a, I, you know, I, I sorry, I should have answered your question directly, but I'm I'm new at this. That I did find a quote from Roger, he, and I could not obtain the original interview, but it was quoted in a magazine where he noted, oh gosh, five, seven years ago, he said, I'm not really worried about my legacy because I know my enemies will define me negatively. It was, I think it was probably 2013. It was sort of extraordinary to say, too late, there's nothing I can do about what they're going to do to me. 
and whoever they is is an interesting question. And that was a, that, that had an influence on me when I was deciding to make the film. Like he sort of knew his legacy was going to be defined by his enemies, meaning the media, or he perceived them as his enemy. And um, so he chose to do that. He could have left Fox five years earlier, probably had a different outcome in his life. Um, he stayed on, made some money, continued to do something that was very important to him, which was running Fox. Yeah. So uh, he chose to be the man in the arena. You know, um, he wasn't born into it. He fought for it. He earned it. And he came to define it. So it's just really interesting, the choices you make. What you're, saying, it, what you're saying sounds so Shakespearean. It, sound, it sounds like, you know, something that could be plucked out of a Shakespearean plot, actually. And maybe that's almost a soliloquy, what he said there. But I want to sure. move on, because I, I like to fill the audience in as, as, as we have these discussions. And I want them to know that, that my guest here, Michael Barnes, uh, interviewed on camera uh, among, among all the people. I'm just going to give some names out here. And you've seen some of them in what we've already shown here. But there was Vice President, uh, former Vice President Dan Quayle, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Rudy Giuliani, Rush Limbaugh, Bill O'Reilly, who you just saw, and Elizabeth Ailes, Roger Ailes' widow, along with his son and, and his brother. Um, and you also have clips of President Trump in the film. How did you manage to convince Elizabeth Ailes to give you access to so much material? And how did you win the trust of those big gun Republicans. Yeah. I'm thinking it was those blue eyes and your boyish smile, but I have a <laughs> feeling maybe not. Well, okay, there's a few trade secrets in there, um, but I'll, as to the president, um, I interviewed him remotely in the in the Rose Garden. So the clips that you see were- They were dumb uh, for you? Yeah, he, yes. Wow. I, yeah. I mean, I'm impressed that, that you actually went that high in the American government. I was surprised myself, <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I think it's the first sitting president to do a documentary. So I was, I was pretty stoked. Um, I owe a debt of gratitude to, you know, rest his, you know, not only to my father and my mother, but to Pat Cadell, who died during production. Um, Pat was a famous, uh, he'd been a, a Democratic pollster and advisor back in the 70s and 80s and had continued on political consulting. And he was a Fox uh, contributor and he was a client of mine. Because uh, Roger liked to have you know a stable of Democratic um, contributors and and conservative Republican contributors, and Pat vouched for me with some people, including the family. Pat said, you know, Michael's a straight shooter, so you know li listen to him. So that I think was my initial in. Not only that's how I met Roger Ailes, but that's how I I met the family. And once you have someone say, yeah, he he's not going to do what everybody else does and stick it you know, stick a knife in your back, you can trust him for the first 20 minutes. And that, it rolls from there. So I owe, again, a lot of gratitude to Pat Cadell for getting a lot of this started. And Elizabeth Ailes gave you access to everything, it seems, which... Uh, he, uh, Roger, you know, ran a media company, and he kept files and tapes and books, and I, we my production team and I called it the equivalent of a presidential library. So just digitizing, yeah, just digitizing it took months and months and months. And we didn't, you know, it was a haystack, a huge one. We didn't know where to start. So we did have access to the haystack and, uh, you know, found some good stuff, which begat more things and begat more things. Yeah. Um, what, so why that did was, he keep, why did he keep an audio, sounded like an audio diary, telling his life story. Why, why was that recorded in the first place? Do you know? Well, there was no it. There was not one, you know, safe that said, here are my secret files. We found cassette tapes of seminars that he gave in the 80s. We found cassette tapes of him with a, a co-writer when he wrote a best-selling book. And they're just shooting the shit. I mean, they, he's just talking about it. Oh. And we found oh. tens and tens of hours of those. And yeah. then we found some contemporary things, which were iPhone recordings, talking after dinner. So there was no box that we found. It was a little here and a little here. And when we were done, there were dozens and dozens of hours of 
you know, Roger Ailes, you know, never really intended to be public, but him just sitting around talking. Spooky. They were, and so we had, you know, some of the design, the sound was degraded. We had to fix it. Yeah. But that was a treasure trove. And when you talk about finding the needles in the haystack, those were truly the needles because it allowed us to have Roger, you know, with some help from us, um, tell his own story. He was the narrator of his own biography. And then Academy Award winner John Voigt came in and helped out. Let's note that. Oh, yeah. And, and that, was our, that was our true needle in the haystack. Uh, that was that was uh, an absolutely brilliant find. Um, I'm just wondering while we're talking about this, and I mentioned, and I'm, I'm going to just let me just uh, I'll wait, and then I'll, I was going to put some photos up to show a list of people who uh, are shown in this film. But um, I was wondering today, uh, the, the day that this show is going out live, if anyone's watching it on uh, on. on um, let's say YouTube or listening to it on tune in radio, the day this is being, uh, going out live, uh, is Friday, October the 2nd. And it's the day where we heard that, uh, the president and his wife have, um, have got COVID a mild form of it. So I'm wondering, he's going to be at home with not an awful lot to do. He loves Fox <laughs> news. Are you, or have you, or will you send him a copy of the film and ditto to that question? to all the other people who appeared in it? Um, they all have copies. Um, we all, of course, we send out courtesy copies and uh, we wanted all of our participants to have you know, copies of the film before it came out. Um, so I don't know if the president and the first lady have watched it. I, and maybe they'll have an opportunity now, but um, well, that'd be great. I thought you'd get a quote from him, and at least then you can put it on, you know, billboards when we go back to getting these films in in the cinemas. Um, I'm also assuming that the, uh, and I love this, and we're talk, talking now about just the production quality and, and the way that this film was produced. I'm assuming the open and close of your film of a tape recorder was, in fact, Ailes, and I'm hoping the answer is yes, otherwise... Uh, it's, it's a fantasy that, uh, that's going to evaporate here, but, uh, it was in fact Ailes tape recorder and in his home because it was simply, uh, it, it was, it was simple yet a, a dramatic way to bookend the story, the film. Right. Um, I'm going to half please you. That was his home. That was his man cave, his library. Uh, so what you saw were, you know, the dying moments of a man in, as I envisioned it. The um, there were two tape recorders, courtesy of eBay. I was a I was a stereo kid back in the 70s, and yeah. I had real you know I had all those tape machines. So I went back and found the vintage ones that someone decided to sell on eBay. So and you know I grew up watching Mission Impossible with the tape machines. So that was our editorial insertion. That was not Roger's actual um, tape machine. Um, the the tapes you would have seen would have been old cassettes with cassette tapes that we found and there was an iphone not nearly as dramatic as what we found but that was his that was his house that was his man cave that's for library um, was, which was, i thought gave it an authentic yeah you know, i, I actually it, it yeah. had a very rich feel to it and it had a very i thought it was a very clever i mean what do i know i don't make films you do but i i thought it was very clever and dramatic open and close to the story um, the film actually is more than a documentary, it, it, and it also feels, and I'm talking now uh, subjectively, it, it, it almost feels as if Ailes directed it himself. Did, mm. did you feel at any time that you were channeling him? I mean, it's the same way an actor tells me that they become the person they are portraying after a short period of time. Sure. Did you ever feel that he was just channeling you to make this? Absolutely, for this reason. Um, let's say there were 60 hours of tapes. The number of hours I listened to those tapes, like podcasts, you know, again and again and again, because you, you hear different things as you listen to them. At some point, I'm just channeling what he's saying on those tapes, as well as the many videos and the books that he wrote. Um, yeah, you, you, Roger did his own film. This is you know, an autobiography in some sense. Of course, he's passed away, but those tapes really were what made me try to channel Roger and Roger's voice 
hopefully I did a good job. But yeah. Uh, so yes, to your question. Well, well, we we will uh, talk about Roger uh, in a few minutes um, and and some of the things that he accomplished because there was so much. But I'm I'm just sort of getting to that now. And you, I think it was you who said. Uh, hearing multiple voices is one of history's great engines oh. for the discovery of truth. And, yeah, I mean, I agree with that. But that's assuming the multiple voices are all offering differing opinions. What if the voices are from the people who have been brainwashed as they were in, say, Nazi Germany? Sure. You know, it's I, my takeaway, for better or worse, from this uh, film really goes back to how valuable Hans Christian Andersen got it right in the 1830s. He, he was the author of the emperor's new clothes. And if you go back and read the original of that, not the 25 versions, but the original, um, boy, everything you need to know about social psychology is in that children's story. And, um, why does an entire community, you know, walk around, even though they know the emperor has, he's naked. Why do they all pretend and talk as if he has clothes on? It's, you know, we can all have all kinds of names we assign to it if we go to college, but that's the emperor's new clothes. It's gaslighting. It's really um, the issues and the group of issues of our day. So when we talk about media, we talk about fake news, propaganda, um, they're all in the same family of issues. Roger's prescription and the reason he started Fox News was simple. He said, yeah, everybody's got their agenda, but listen to both sides or, or more than one side. Listen to them both, and that's the closest we can come to being fair. And that sounds so obvious. It's like, duh. Yeah. But that that is now a contested concept you know, in today's world. It's extraordinary to me, you know, having been grown up the last several decades. If, um, I think Laura Logan said it perfectly well. The uh, CBS 60 Minutes reporter who graciously, you know, allowed allowed me to interview her. She said, "Look, people like to say that, you know, the Fox News and the different uh, channels are a symbol of how divided we are. Maybe it's a symbol of how free we are." And you know, coming from Laura, where she's seen many societies around the world war torn, where it's just one voice, one tyrannical, um, you know, dictator, where there's civil wars being fought. It's a really good perspective. Yeah. And, and yeah. I think that Rogers and his Fox News, as we really try to point out in the film, um, that's to me his legacy is in terms of actually exercising the First Amendment and having different voices as opposed to one mono voice, one big brother voice. Fox News, I, I challenge you to pick a more forceful example of that over the last two decades i don't think there is yeah i mean it it is definitely a different voice um chattering away than than all the others that sure uh, that's that's what the intention was i want to show another i just want to put these clips in because i actually loved all of them and uh we've got plenty more to talk about here but this is the clip that we're going to roll now which i call vietnam war you'll know what it is and we're rolling it right now so when Roger Ailes entered politics, uh, the country was torn apart by the Vietnam War. It's this new radical movement that didn't like the American government. I'm not committed to nonviolence in any way. N- not to say that he was accepting of a bad war or he was judgmental about people who were smoking pot. We got 26,000 guys getting shot at for no f-ing reason here. We, get, we, we got nothing to win over there. That's not what it was. It was America's noble. Don't. You, you, dissent is fine, but don't tear the whole fabric of the country down. So he allowed himself with those kinds of politicians. I, I just like that clip, but I, I want to, um, there's a person in the clip I want to talk about. He, Man in the Arena, uh, from what I remember seeing, which was only two days ago uh, in your film, uh, was also... Uh, Ailes' vision for Nixon when he created the town hall style meeting based on Shakespeare's Globe Theatre in the Round, which Ailes saw in London, uh, by working with Nixon on his election and having this, what we now know is the, you know, the town hall meeting, that ultimately won Nixon the the presidency. And um, that 
I mean, we, we're seeing in your film, um, not, of course, the disgraced man, but we are seeing how this man changed both in uh, uh, television and in politics, the shape of this country. Uh, and it was extraordinary to learn so much of this. I mean, th I didn't realize that he, uh, firstly, I didn't know he worked with Nixon. And uh, secondly, I didn't know that, and he was, when he worked with Nixon, he came up with this. He was still in his 20s, wasn't he? Yeah, he was 20, uh, 26. Six, yeah, 25, yeah. six. Yeah. yeah. Had a cush job as the executive producer of the most popular talk show in America. And he, he left. He left to go be a TV consultant to Richard Nixon. And his show that he was on was uh, was uh, in Philadelphia. The Michael... Um, I've just forgotten the show's name, but the Mike, Mike Douglas, Mike Douglas, Mike Douglas. That's I think it was still on when I came to the States, the Mike Douglas show in Philadelphia. So uh, and and that's how he met Nixon. But uh, he, he used his experience in television to teach political candidates. He was helping that showmanship. This is what I took away from this, that uh, showmanship and theatrics were as important as policy. And uh, JFK, of course, had proven that, proved that sure. in the first televised presidential debate against Nixon, who was eventually, as I just said, helped by Ailes and won. Reagan and Bush Sr. were tutored by Ailes. It, it, it was a style which was peppered with some humor. Uh, from looking back at their style, there was even some self-deprecation. Uh, while also, the most important thing is, he got them, even Nixon, to embrace the audience, to uh, you know, to 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 show the audience that they really cared about them, and to, and to talk directly to the audience. And it got me thinking after watching this week's first presidential, probably only presidential debate. Do you think Ailes' tactics have now been abandoned? By um, abandoned generally, or abandoned by I mean, uh, Trump you, and Biden? Well, they were certainly abandoned this week, but do you think people are going to continue in the future to, to use this in endearing, um, uh, interested um, exterior when they're doing a town hall style meeting? Because, and, 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 I mean, whatever we, we have seen in recent years has very much had Ailes' thumbprint on it. Sure, absolutely. I, my gut is that social media has probably, you know, has already started a new era where the social media is going to be more important than television. Mm. Probably still some yeah. overlap to it, but um, so, but the era of Roger Ailes started in '68. That uh, probably still true in 2016. Um, is it is it passing into a new era? I think some people would argue yes, but boy, that's a heck of a run. That's fifty year run. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I, I, had, I had no idea, and and people watching your film, I think, will 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 be gobsmacked to to use an old expression for the old country at, at some of the stuff that you are sharing about this man with us. He, he what what is the takeaway again for students of media in that is Roger thought things were disintermediated or mediated. He saw that what was standing between the candidate and the voters were a lot of people he and the candidate didn't control. And if you didn't define yourself directly with the audience, somebody else was going to define you. And Roger, correctly or incorrectly, I, I think he was correct, perceived the media as becoming more and more hostile to conservatives and Republicans in that era. And accordingly, you better hook up connect, uh, directly with your audience because if you don't, your enemies are going to define you. And so he did that with Nixon. He helped with Reagan, although Reagan was an expert. Yes. He certainly helped um, you know, with, with Bush. And then with a number of politicians in the 80s, he you know, took them straight uh, to their audience. We show you know, the, the Dan Rather episode um, with Bush, which was, again, really the, the second great play after Nixon, his play with Bush to bypass what he thought was an a, a negative hostile press with George Bush and it worked. And well, um, I, I want to touch on that. Move. I want to touch on that rather thing in a minute. Cause I have already in an email or whenever mentioned that to you, but I, what, what this also triggered this film, you know, I sat back after the film 
and I I know I I I just wrote a lo wrote a load of notes to myself and thoughts to myself because it did open thoughts not only about Roger Ailes but about people I've known who have had issues uh, that they weren't guilty of but they were you know th there was so much crap dug up about them or thrown out about them online and elsewhere that it was in many cases un unju unjustified and unfair but Winston Churchill said uh, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth has a chance to get its pants on sure however that you know, I was I was thinking about that, and then I thought, well, yeah, but these days it's a nanosecond, <laughs> and 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 the pants are forgotten entirely in the rush. So yeah. the question that I was left with, and I I needed to ask you, because uh, I don't know who else to ask at this particular time, is if we can't trust the traditional media, and we can't trust social media, who do we trust for truth? For, for, for genuine news and truth? Well, if I had that answer, I wouldn't tell you and I would secretly set that company up and make $100 billion <laughs> uh, is the short answer. Um, but, you know, there's, uh, let me go on the weeds, but I'll take 10 seconds. There's something called Gresham's Law in monetary theory that when, when things that are being passed around are fake, like fake money, fiat money, the real stuff, the gold gets taken behind closed doors and hoarded um, bad money forces out good you know bad communication can force out good communication I think what we're seeing is people's real opinions are going behind closed doors now hmm. and it, it's too bad I don't know when it'll reemerge or what will allow us to once again talk truthfully in public but as we go behind closed doors, I think that's where truth is unfortunately maybe mass media and public media, We've just passed the period where that's going to contain truth, like it probably did contain truth 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, 70 years ago. But I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not optimistic that we're going to get back to that golden age. Yeah. That's, well, I, I think I tend to agree with you on that. Uh, what also, um, well, I'm, I'm sort of going back on something I've already said a couple of times. But your, your film, um, Man in the Arena, shows how Ailes changed media and politics because most of us only knew him as the man behind Fox News. But this this film, uh, you mentioned Digging Deep, which is, uh, talk about digging deep. I mean, this 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 film reveals so much uh, about how he changed media and politics. And essentially, what you've done here is, you're, yeah, in many cases, you're showing, because you're telling us what he did, uh, you're revealing how a magician does his tricks, which mm. I I really enjoyed that aspect. There's so many sure. layers here, but I I mean, you know, somebody that that really appreciates marketing and and uh, television and and media in general, the way that it is presented, uh, I thought that was brilliant. Some of the stuff. So, did you know the extent of his genius before you began researching him? And from what you show us in great detail, I feel comfortable using the word genius. I think it's appropriate. Yeah, I did not. Um, and I'll just give two points where it revealed itself. I remember coming home and watching the 88 Republican convention on TV with rabbit ears. And I thought George Bush was a wimp. And I saw that that clip of him being pulled out of the drink as a Navy pilot. I also remember the Reagan debate in 84. And, you know, as a young man, I remembered those. And as I was listening to Roger's tapes and or you know, reading, those were referenced. And when I went back and found those pieces of media and then realized that Roger, had that was his work. Yes. And that yeah. were kind of seminal political points I remember. That's where I woke up and realized, oh my God, what, I don't want to say puppet master, but what other things were the work of Roger? And, and that was revelatory, that, that he was Absolutely. so important decades and decades before Fox News ever started. Absolutely. I mean, this this is, there was an entire life. So many people have entire lives before you know their life. Sure. Um, which they don't discuss and you don't discover. It takes somebody like yourself to polish them up a bit and sure. present them to so, us. So I tried to, like, almost like the Wizard of Oz scene, scene where you see the, 
the the the, the Oz behind the yeah, curtain. Yeah. Um, I we focus in the film Man in the Arena on both of those, and because I had Roger narrating them, we could line up the historical footage with Roger, you know, talking to his buddies after after dinner one night, just talking about it, and you can hear Roger's explanation of what he was doing in that moment, and you see George Bush do it, and you see Ronald Reagan do it, and you can't unsee that. I mean, no, that's... and I, I don't want you to mention, uh, you know, a couple of, I don't want you to give away too much, because okay, so I, I, I know that you, uh, that I have a tendency to do that, so don't fair talk enough. about the Roger, the, uh, the, the, the Reagan moment, but we all know it. Um, and I'm focusing here on aspects of his life rather than the obvious, because I think, if people are going to watch this film, I think they might want to watch it for, for uh, uh, to discover some fascinating uh, aspects of the world of television and politics that they have never even sure. thought to attribute to anyone in, in particular. You do actually include warts and all uh, in the film, and, and especially, specifically in a moment when Elizabeth Ailes, his, uh, his wife, recalls her last words to her dying husband, Roger. Uh, we, uh, she says, Roger, uh, we need you. Please come back to us. Please come back. I forgive you. She admits knowing of one affair that Ailes had. Mm -hmm. But she also notes, and I think this for me was, was the most powerful statement in your film and the one uh, that, that resonated with me because she was his wife. She clearly loved him uh he was uh he, he you know he, she she forgave him for something but she made this statement in the film the world and i and i don't know if i if i remember it entirely correctly but it was along the lines of the world has forgotten to be loving and compassionate Passionate. and that hit home with me that uh that that really did hit home with me um i thought that that sentence really and truly summed up your film it it's you know oh let me compliment you you're very astute that uh uh that moment when elizabeth ailes you know emotionally revealed what she was thinking and what was going on it sent me back to read the old testament or excuse me the new testament because that idea of redemption and forgiveness you know, a lot of our judeo-christian culture is built on that every from the prodigal son to turn the other cheek to, you know, so many of the parables and the teachings that religion is based upon. And it, it, I deep dove after I heard her say that. It, 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 it threw me, not for a loop, but it completed a loop that there was really something there. And I'm, yeah. I'm glad I, she went on film and, and, and gave that emotional um, overview that she did, and it really helped the film. She was very... Um... She was very thoughtful. She was, she, I could see that she was genuinely, passionately giving honest thoughts and comments to you. You can just see the way that she was, she was going back in time and you can, you can Absolutely. read her mind. Now, this must be one of your friends, relatives, somebody you just paid to say this. I don't know. Mark John Randazza. Um, he just said, I may be biased, but this is a great biopic. Who is Mark John Randazza? You have to know. because he's Mark his... is a, was one of our clearance lawyers. Um, oh, okay. Film, and he is a fierce, <laughs> I'm going to plug him for a minute. He is a fierce First Amendment warrior who is not of the same political stripe as Roger, but realized uh, that Roger was a First Amendment warrior and, and helped us clear the film as in do what you need to do legally under what's called fair use to use 1,700 clips that we used in the film without anyone's permission. And he's, a, a, again, a fierce litigator. I think Mark is responsible for the Epstein takedown. Mark forced the Court of Appeals to open up the Epstein file, which led to you know, our learning over the last year and a half what happened with you know, the, the guy with his evil island. Another story you should have. I Mark think on maybe guest. Mark should do a film and Mark should come on here. You should uh, have I, wanna, as a guest. I wanna let people know who are joining us now that this show uh, is supposed to run from five to six Eastern uh, New York time. Uh, that's uh, 10 to 11 London time for those of you in the UK. 
Uh, but we're going over time, as we tend to do when we have fascinating films to talk about. And my guest has already said, uh, yeah, he'll, you know, I had to send him some money. But he said he'll, he'll stay on a little bit longer. Uh, I want to show another clip because I want to get I want to get all these clips out so people can see them. Uh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you watching this live, um, I will at the end of the film do what I always do on these shows, which is to close with the trailer that we open with. Of course, if you're watching the recording ver recorded version, you you're probably just watching the trailer and trying to avoid looking at me. But anyway, this next one uh, I have called uh, "Try to Destroy Him." And it gets us on to another part of, well, you've been alluding to this all along anyway. So let's roll tape. About that time, then you saw the George Soros money start to come in. It was mid-2000s. Media Matters, Move On, Bonner Group, and they exist today. Surge of money coming in. And they were in business to put Fox News out of business. They try to destroy him, they try to destroy it. They discredit it or try to. They say it's not news, it's whatever it is. It's, it's like some disease over here that's outside the mainstream. You shouldn't trust it. So what do you do? You, you kill the messenger, right? You go after Roger Ailes, because maybe if you can destroy Roger Ailes, maybe Fox doesn't survive beyond him. I must say, Laura Logan, um, I wasn't familiar with her, uh, but I was absolutely intrigued um, by her voice. And, and I was trying to, to source, as it were, uh, where that accent came from. It's, it's obviously a blend of many, but she's from South Africa, so she's yeah. got South African, little British, a little... Uh, I, I could listen to her all night, and I could look at her all night, which is not a sexist comment. It's a comment of, uh, from a man who is a photographer, as well as a podcast host, and I, I would love to take photos of her. I want to point out that uh, George Soros... Uh, for those not familiar with him, is the Hungarian-American billionaire investor and philanthropist who is a supporter of progressive and liberal political causes to which he dispenses donations through his foundation. Um, the uh, numerous American conservatives have claimed that Soros is a singularly dangerous puppet master behind many alleged global plots. And in your film, they're saying that he was... Um, um, essentially uh, using his money to, to try to bring down Ailes' uh, network, I guess. Um, that was just that no was one. just something that was, I mean, to me, that was something that was thrown in that was very relevant, oh. but you didn't dwell on it because there was so much to dwell on. Sure. It, um, the, the point that was made by a number of the, the interviewees was when Fox first started, the first five years, nobody cared because nobody was watching them. That's right, yeah. And only when they became, this is a theme that you know Rush Limbaugh touched upon, only when they became popular and they had people watching them, in fact, became the number one uh, news channel you know, by twice over anyone else, did the enemies come out and start taking them down or attempting to. No one cared when they didn't have an audience. Only when Fox got an audience did... You know, they believe George Soros and others step up and start putting money in to oppose them. Um, we saw a lot of evidence of that. You can go buy the books. You can read the articles. They, they're definitely uh, Fox, as well as Roger Ailes, were you know, targeted um, and gets into a whole different uh, you know, topic of a you know, completely topic different topic. Alike. Yeah. We see it play out, playing out in our current politics of um you know, whichever side you're on, but, uh, you know, going after the other guy and whether you're justifiably pointing out their shortcomings or smearing them, um, that's sort of the currency of the realm, unfortunately. And uh, Fox News and Roger were not exempt from that. And they they were pursued very hard uh, once they became very successful after already 2003, 2005. Yeah. Uh, and I mentioned to you when we were doing our a pre-show sound check yesterday, which I always do with my guests the day before the show. Uh, something that I, I I want to mention now for the audience because this this is so important for me. This was uh, a moment where I I I 
sat bolt upright, I had to do some of my own deep diving after this because <laughs> we can't go into what it was because otherwise we're giving away the film. But I can just say that people, when people see this, it's worth doing what I did and looking at the entire conversation on YouTube. Man in the Arena is compelling for me and I'm sure for many people because it shows how the respected and trusted media of Murrow and Cronkite began to disintegrate by adopting a political agenda even yeah. before cable news was born. Absolutely. And the pivotal moment for me, and it should be for everyone, but this may slip by people, so I'm going to tell you now because I think you will find, if you trust me on this, this is a pivotal moment in the film. That was an incident which Michael's already alluded to between Dan Rather, who a lot of people will remember, and George Bush Sr., orchestrated off camera by none other than Roger Ailes. I'm not giving any more information to the audience, but this for me, this for me, when I first came to the States, there was a show called Happy Days, and an expression was used for when Happy Days did something a little bit strange this for me was the moment that trusted tv you know what i'm going to say jump the shark <laughs> you've got to agree with me on that because you put it yeah. in the film a absolutely um it, it was i've had a number of people who watched it who you know maybe don't follow television as much or politics in my case and they thought yeah you know boy what what's that all about you know seems like it's you know you could lose that and i tell them you know Go watch it again, because that's the pivot point of the film, that if you want to understand what, you know, the, the eyeglasses Roger was looking through and what he saw, that was the moment. And if you understand that, even if you don't agree with him or with Rush Limbaugh's description of it, even if you don't agree with him, that's how he saw the world. And it gestalts in the story of Roger and partly why he started Fox News. So it is important, and I'm, I'm glad you recognized it because um, that's why I put it in. How could you not? How could you not? That that for me is the central part. Hello, Nick, my old mate. Thanks for joining us. We are running uh, longer today, so you you haven't missed the show, and you'll have to watch the beginning of it on uh, on YouTube because this is this is a, a terrific conversation we're having. You said my aim is to present Roger Ailes accurately and in context to give viewers a deeper understanding of what free speech actually means and to fascinate them with the incredible and unlikely story of Roger Ailes and the obstacles he continually overcame. It is quite remarkable that well before there was any... Um, Oh, let me just, I'm going to stop there with that because uh, we have a great film director who's been a guest on this show, Jack Danini. Can't wait to check it out, especially with everything going on right now. Good seeing you. Phil. Okay, yes, Jack, please watch this. This is a fellow filmmaker and uh, you both do stellar work. Uh, but talking about uh, uh, what Roger Ailes had to put up with through his life, uh, I think it was because of you know we haven't touched and i i was going to but i don't think it's necessary at this point the fact that you know he was born with hemophilia uh so he wanted to go into the military he couldn't go into the military because of course once you start bleeding that uh that is a problem and when you're in the military bleeding can happen um he he was actually on a chain gang i i thought that was just for people who were in prison but no he was working uh he was digging streets and things i mean he really he he had so much against him becoming the type of uh, getting the type of position he got and all through his life there was obstacles and hurdles and just one of these people that seems to have said okay other people walk away from obstacles uh i don't because i'm the one person that I'm going to succeed with it. So um, when you said you want to present him accurately and in context to give people an idea of what free speech is about and everything, we have this, this idea uh, of, of what Fox News is about or what CNN is about, but, but this really gives a bare-bones 
truthful assessment of the man behind it and what he was looking to do. And what he was trying to do was to get free speech because he he saw what we've already discussed that especially after what this this uh, episode I just mentioned with Dan Rather, he saw the way that television and, and media was going and that it was sure. all one-sided. So, Absolutely. So you've achieved that in the film, haven't you? Well, you know, I think so. Um, you know, again, I was channeling Roger, so in some sense Roger achieved it. I was just channeling it and, and, and using all of his media and his audio to put it in one place. So, um, but I, I think so. I hope that message comes through that, that you, you know, obviously picked up on it means at least someone's getting the message. But that's and, and I'm pretty certain. thick. I mean, you know, yeah. so I'm 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 pretty down here intellectually. So if if the other people are up here, they're all going to get it. You know, yeah. I just I I'm just a nerd. I'm afraid when I watch somebody's film, I watch it and I eat every morsel of it because they've gone to the trouble. I mean, I mean, this film. I, I, there's, I cannot, to me, this film is like brain surgery. What you performed here, God knows how many photos, a couple of thousand photos, 60 hours of recordings. Knowing how to stitch this all together into a tapestry that has a beginning and an end is, is just remarkable. And, and I think this is an opportunity for me to mention some of your team, two people that I think, I mean, I know the whole team and you had a big team on this and I know everyone does their part, but two people uh, in conjunction with you made this film as fascinating, as compelling as it was. Scooter Downey did a remarkable, remarkable editing job on this film, complemented by Justin Burnett's perfectly constructed soundtrack. Together... I feel they have crafted a riveting, rapidly paced film, skillfully written and directed by you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, my thought at the beginning was, you know, or at the end was, it grabs you by your nose hairs from the opening scene and doesn't release your nose hairs until the screen goes blank after the closing credits. Yeah, I mean, you. that is an amazing thing in a documentary about somebody we thought we knew. And we well, thought thank you. that we were going to, I mean, a lot of, well, we'll get to that in a minute. You can, you can respond to what I just said. Uh, well, I think those people thank are you. Those are great shout outs for the team. I want to just add a few people. Phil White came in and, you know, edited uh, kind of the last several months of the film because Scooter had a prior commitment. So I really had two editors on it. Oh. So I have to give Phil White uh, credit. Um, and critical point for any, want to be filmmakers or uh, want to be YouTubers. Um, if you're used to drama and, and scripted entertainment, everyone has a very defined role. If you're making a documentary, all those titles go out the window. At the end of it, you kind of decide, okay, who is the writer? Who is the director? Who's the editor? Even um, So it is much more of a team making effort or a team effort than the, the much more formalized scripted program. So I, I'm a writer for director producer but i got news for you there's a lot of people who helped direct it and helped write it and helped edit it and you know they're listed and at the end of it i even list you know nine anonymous people who were some of my my, my deep throat inside sources at fox and other places who also helped so yeah um scooter was great and and justin's soundtrack was sublime um sublime and it's really, it's really, and you notice time. it at times and then you you notice yeah. it when you're supposed to notice it when the adrenaline starts pumping i yeah. mean it's it's almost like watching a watching a story about a historical event which of course it was and knowing how it's going to play out but still yeah. getting get, getting caught up in it swept up in it here we think we know the story and we know nothing <laughs> and I, and i grew up and, and to this day, I am uh, a, a, such a passionate uh, space and, uh, uh, well, real space, not science fiction. I, I, I love the space program. I have a little, I have a little uh, uh, 
app on my phone when the ISS, the International Space Station, is about sure. to fly over. It beeps. <laughs> it could be three in the morning and I'm out there with my camera trying to, to catch it. When the world, and this, this is something that I, I really need to mention and get off my chest because it really upsets me. When the world watched Richard Nixon talk on the phone to Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, who I'm proud to say has been a guest on my show, my okay. early living hero, um, on the moon's surface. It was a young Roger Ailes. <laughs> who would have known? It was well, no. a young Roger Ailes who orchestrated that televised call from the Oval Office to the Sea of Tranquility. Yeah. Um, but, now, but here's my point. This is, I just want to get this point across. So we've got the Oval, in the Oval Office, two disgraced, powerful men created the most historic moment in the history of television <laughs> while the entire population of the world was watched. watched. Yeah. Their demise, for me, is a hard pill to swallow when juxtaposed... Shakespearean. Shakespearean. Yeah. Shakespearean. I mean, uh, uh, you juxtapose that against this historical moment, and, yeah. and it's heartbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. I, I had... Uh, that, again, it was, it was equally moving for me. I was eight years old or so when I watched that, and, and you know, people have negative things burned into their memories. I have positive things. I remember the Apollo program. I, when I sat down with uh, Vice President Quayle and interviewed him, I'd read in his book that he had been uh, the director of the United States Space Council. And so I mentioned that to, to uh, you know, I, I was talking about the end, you know, Roger doing the, uh, the Apollo shot. And it was, it was very cool as a filmmaker to see Dan Quayle light up and he was lit up anyway, but started talking about the importance of the space program. And, you know, he, he, rem he talked about Apollo and it's in the movie, you know, Dan Quayle narrates that portion for us. And it, it's very moving, particularly if you lived through that period. And if you didn't, it's astounding to go back and think, oh, that's right. This was not preordained that we could get men on the moon and that they could call the president in the Oval Office. <laughs> it was it was indistinguishable from magic in 1960. And it was and it was something that I don't think we'd seen on television before, oh, which no. was it was split screen, split screen, which is what Ailes wanted. I mean, everything was. I remember. I mean, look, I have to say this because it was one of one one of those moments in my life I I will never forget. I was sitting on the floor. I think it was about four o'clock in the morning in London, in my bedroom, in my parents' house, the moon was actually coming through the blinds in my bedroom, and I'm watching. I was actually watching David Foss' show. David Foss hosted an all-night show in which they, they, they went over to there. Um, so here's a serious, a serious aspect of this. Uh, you, you dug deep. We've discussed this at length into Ale's life and career, and you were comfortable telling his story. You've said that the film is filtered through your perspective and uh, the rest is for viewers to decide do you think the audience can watch it without despising the character before the opening credits run without disp um it's a really good question i realize that most people who would watch this I take that back there's three people who will watch it people who are they like fox news they they're going to probably be a natural fan of, of Roger and they're going to like the movie. There's the critics who don't like his politics or who he was aligned with or for political reasons, you know, they, they, he's against them. They, they want to be against him for political reasons. And there's people in the middle who, you know, they, they're a UPS driver in Omaha, as I like to say, they don't even really know who Roger Ailes is. They've heard of Fox news. So kind of the, politically aligned audience, the hostile audience, and then the middle of the road audience. I, I tried to make it for all three um, because you, you want to be fair if you can't make the film to interest people that who otherwise don't care, you probably failed. If you're just preaching to the choir, fine, it's an infomercial. And if yeah. you're pissing off the, the, the enemies, maybe you've done okay but three different audiences and that's what i assumed and my filmmaking team assumed that we had those three audiences i i suppose what i'm think it was thinking about when i wanted to ask you that question is uh if this was my film my concern i would i mean i i would be absolutely over the moon uh 
the moon that Ailes was involved in. Um, if I, I would be over the moon uh, about the, the final product, but my concern would be how to market this so that we would get people who already have a decision to actually sure. turn it on and watch it. And that, yeah. that's a marketing problem that, that, right. that you have you to know, deal with. It, it, it's in a, you know, at some point you just, you realize your limitations. There were three other films about Roger that came out before this. One was a documentary that came and went. Yep. Found out that the director, or the guy who wrote the book on that, I think he was a Soros fellow. He, he, um, so, you know, it had a pretty dark, dank, yep. Roger central casting evil take, which you'd expect. Then there was a, uh, a miniseries that came out in the summer with Russell Crowe, right. uh, which was somewhat based on that documentary. Same kind of same sort of central casting, you know, evil guy. Then there was the uh, lots of actors and actresses who wanted to get awards, and so they sexed it up, and that was the third film that came out. And they were, uh, I think Charlie's Theron. I think that was Charlie's Theron. Uh, yes, and, and others, and you know, yeah. and it got. Uh, what I was going to say is, I haven't seen any of those. I didn't watch the original documentary. I didn't watch the Russell Crowe series. And I didn't watch the final one. And people think I'm nuts. It's like, you have to watch those. I don't know. I'm, I don't I'm think making my should. own villain. I, I so don't, I don't want to react to them. I don't think you should have done because it's the yeah, same way that an actor uh, who's playing uh, a role that, that, that's been played before shouldn't watch the original actor because then yeah. they'll be emulating them or they'll start having... Uh, uh, quite start questioning their own performance. So I think sure. I, I think you're right to do that. I just want to say hi to uh, um, oh I just want to say hi to Candy. A lot of people I haven't said hi to, but hi Candy, I love you. You know that. Um, <laughs> did I cut you off just now? Were you gonna, were you? No, were, I, uh, I just hope I answered your question. Yes, you no, you you absolutely. As to the audience, it, yeah. It, there there was at some point there was so much material, and with once we had Rogers' voice. And you focused on the big events of his life. It almost filled the hour and a half, became two hours for the film. Um, it, we weren't stuck with, you know, one little nice morsel. Then you try to fill it out for 90 oh, minutes. No. There's just you, so you, much you there so much. That, you, you, that that kind of helped make the decision on what the audience wanted to see, which is show the interesting things in his life and show behind the scenes in his own voice. Um, it, yeah. Hard I, to see. I, I, I mean, besides also, besides having this cast of characters that you've got in this film who you managed, uh, and I must just ask you something about that before we wrap this up. I'm not going to keep you all night, but I've got, <laughs> I, I do need to get through a few more things I want to yeah. know about. You've got Academy Award winning actor John Voight narrating part of the film, uh, both him and, and Ailes' voice. Uh, I'm assuming this was because, uh, I, I don't think it was because Voight said that uh, uh, it, it, it was God who helped uh, Donald Trump become president. I think it was more because he was a good friend of ours, for, uh, I think for about, what, 15 years. And, and, and he believed in what you were doing because it was his friend. Is, is, am I correct? Is that why you chose him? Um, or he was cheap? We, we may, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny. I'll have a different answer for that over 10 years, but I'll, I'll just really? tell you how it happened and we can figure out over 10 years why it happened. Uh, my production team and I, we were trying to decide, should we have someone narrate this? And, and I, we thought, yes, we need to fill in some gaps. Um, and I thought we came up with a list of a couple of people. John Voigt was right there at the top of the list, including because there's a lot of people who wouldn't touch this with a 10 foot pole because they wouldn't want to be associated with a Roger Ailes movie during the middle of kind of the, the Jacobin period of the Me Too movement. Yeah. So John Voigt's not afraid of anything. So um, I, I was introduced to him just briefly, like, hey, someone, or, Mr. Voigt, would you talk to Michael Barnes? And I left him a voicemail, and I'm sitting with my producers at lunch having a hamburger, and the phone rings, and it says, John Voigt. <laughs> and we looked at each other, and I'm like, and real time. This is I, Midnight I just, Cowboy on the phone. I, 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 I'm a kid from Iowa, and there's the Academy <laughs> Award John Voigt on the phone. So I, I, I pitched him for... 15 seconds with a burger and he goes sure sounds great i said i'll call you back and we just looked at each other and you just assume we've been punked that that wasn't real that, it just so why he did it why he so readily agreed it certainly wasn't my 15 second pitch or maybe it was it just sort of came 
together and he did a fantastic jo- fantastic job as you probably saw so I, i'm not sure did he possibly he talk to roger l's wife and she you know i mean that's a possibility surely absolutely and yep. uh, and elizabeth may have you know you have greased that or I, I, I don't know, and it, it was such a good outcome. I really don't want to know. <laughs> he, he, his voice is perfect for it, and um, and as you say, there's not too many people that would have wanted to to touch it. Um, it's I, the truth. I, I mean, yeah, it's the unfortunate truth. It's yeah. I, I assume that um, I assume that your approach to making this film was guided by your expertise in in the legal world, and you sifted through material to find some evidence or a clue or a morsel of information as a building block for your story and if that's the case you are clearly more sherlock holmes than inspector clouseau i mean <laughs> it goes without saying did you use, uh, did you use your your legal uh process to 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 try to find the evidence the information that would form your film a good question yeah i guess so i wouldn't really call it my legal research it was more of just as i'd mentioned to you having been there i'd I'd lived through these periods and so i remembered things and then once i learned that roger was involved then we would search for it in the interviews or in his books or in presidential archives for example we knew what to look for we knew what the key words were right right and and that was more what it was kind of like a, a a google search a boolean search um, but it was uh, it was more needle in a haystack and and just searching, finding something in that like when you're surfing the internet and you go into a rabbit hole in the internet, one thing begats another. We were much more that way on this. And not I'd like to say we were efficient and we were expert and we knew what we were doing. We were we were kind of blind without a flashlight in the attic at first, just trying well, to figure out what the world of Roger Ailes was. The reason I included uh, that that uh, nice comment about you from one of your clients at the beginning is because I felt that represented what you did on this film, that you are detail orientated. I mean, I, I, I thought that was very apt. And, and I realized when I saw this film, how detail orientated you would have, you must have been. I want to ask you a question. I'm not putting you on the spot. And this isn't a trick question. Obviously, this isn't the kind of show it is. But, you know, I, I, as I said, I've come away from your damn film with more questions and more, more, you know, uh, thoughts rolling around in my head. And fortunately, I have the situation where I can ask the man who made the film. I wanted <laughs> to know if, if this film is about freedom of speech uh, or the politicization of television news in America uh, or the the genius of a man who created presidents and media empires or your disillusioned assessment of the American dream? It is not the latter. It's not my disillusionment with the American dream at all. Um, I You'll have to book me for another hour to go into some (laughs) But look, there were there was a, a generation. This Roger was part of the silent generation and the greatest generation, where um, they had seen existential adversity, the Depression, World War II, and some would say Vietnam, where your friends were being drafted. But existential, like, are we going to exist anymore? And that molds people and it molds a society. I'm not sure today's generations, including myself, have had that existential um, thing. Maybe the threat of nuclear war, um, but it, it molds you, and um, I think it helps the American. It it underpinned the American dream of individuals, particularly from the wrong side of the tracks, working hard believing in the system because they've understood the existential threat of not doing that. And he's just a great example of that. I mean, he's chapter one, page one of Horatio Alger. He wasn't born rich. He didn't have rich parents. He didn't have powerful uncle. He was a nobody. And look what he did. Um, That's probably what drives me more than anything. Have we lost that permanently because we're such a rich culture and we haven't had existential crises that you know, a generation needs to see 
in order to really embrace that American dream. That's probably more of, you know, the the the, the Freudian undertones or whatever you want to say that we're yeah. here. That he just, come on, man, he was it. If if you're going to show a Horatio Alger story, which has Shakespearean and in New Testament elements to it, man, uh, Roger Ailes, who else are you going to pick? He's certainly he's certainly one of them. Well, yeah, uh, that's mean, simple. The, yeah. The, as I said all along, and uh, we're, we're going to be wrapping up shortly. I do promise you this isn't going to be what, but it just looks like we're on for a two-hour show today, which happens when I have a guest who is well, absolutely you. engaging, as you are, which is always a gift for me and for anyone that does this type of show. Ailes said something very profound, and we've, we've shown it um, in the, uh, I guess it was in the trailer, which we'll be showing again at the end. Uh, this quote from him is, what they called me is opinion, what I've done is on the record. That is a very profound, but also a very, I feel, very confident statement. Yeah. What they called me is opinion. So that's, in other words, I mean, I had to break this down. What they call, because it's a strange sentence, but he's saying that what people have called him is their opinion of him. But what he's achieved is on the record. And I think what you've done here is to add to the latter part of that statement. Yeah. I, I promise your audience, you and I did not prearrange that, but you, you've identified one of the drivers of the really pushed me to make the movie because that, that, that phrase, you know, what I, what they call me as opinion, what I've done is on the record is diametrically opposed to his interview a few years before he died, where he said, my enemies will define my legacy. It's almost as if he realized, wow, I'm, I'm not sure what I've done on the record is actually ever going to be told. And it was almost a call to action. So that you you pick up on that. That was once we the team and I found that quote and we had him saying that we realized that was a money shot. And it again, there was this sadness later in his life where eh, my my legacy's set. My enemies are going to define me. So we chose to put to as you say finish out that prophecy. You know what I've done is on the record, and hopefully this film is you know part of that. God knows he left a lot of media behind. He was one of the people talked about him. They did shows. They did magazine articles. They attacked him. He was talked about a lot. So there's a lot of material out there that oh, records yeah. what he did. But hopefully we're, we add to that body in a, in a contextual way. Well, you, don't, it, you don't have a one-sided view of it. it. You don't have, as I said at the beginning, and I like the word, you don't have an agenda for this film. Your agenda is to give... Uh, an honest, uh, from your perspective, uh, an honest um, overview of what this man has done. And what I've taken away from this film uh, isn't Fox News. I mean, that was that was uh, uh, part you know, of that was part of his career. But it was all the other stuff we've spoken about, uh, Kingmaker, and uh, sure. you know, making he made three presidents for goodness' sake. <laughs> uh, I was wondering. I don't even know if you can answer this. And again, this is my strange brain working overtime, but I sat back afterwards and I was thinking, if you would have been allowed to look into the allegations, because as I said at the beginning, uh, there were certain things you couldn't touch, there were certain things you weren't allowed to do um, because of court orders or whatever. Um, but if you would have been allowed to look into the allegations and to pursue the other side of the argument, have you thought about how your film might have changed or is it possible you might not have made it at all? Have you ever given that sure. any thought? No, absolutely. It's a, it's a good question. Um, there were no quarters against us. It's just, and, and we did look into it. it. We had, there were off ramps to the highway. If, if my team and I would have found anything that we weren't, that, you know, moral monsters, I like to say, I wouldn't have made the film. We would have stopped. None of us had any interest in glorifying, you know, a bad man. We um, got to be careful what I say. We didn't find that, and we did research it, and we did talk to a lot of people. What we weren't able to do is come in and say, we're going to hold a trial here, and we're going to tell you everything we learned that you haven't learned about, call it the allegations. Because I didn't want to make a Me Too movie. No interest in making a Me Too movie. That's why we focused on the other parts of his life. But... Um, 
high level of confidence um, of a reality that allowed me to go forward. And I note, and we, we, we address the Me Too um, allegations, we do throw up a, a couple, a couple facts people may not know. Yeah. But I, I, I will point this out, and again, I, I have to be careful for legal reasons what I say. One of the books that, the, the book that came out about Roger, that was the definitive book by, the, I think he was a Soros fellow, um, bragged about having interviewed 600 people about Roger. And this came out, I think in 2015, maybe 2014. And I read that book. And there wasn't a peep, not a peep in that book that even came close to the allegations that came out against him. If you deep dive someone for two years as an you know, opposition and talk to 600 people, including people at Fox, and none of it comes out, as a lawyer, I'd say, that's relevant. That's, that's relevant. And that was a factor in us going forward, that if you look at the opposition research that was done, it was a book and movies were made about it, and got a clean bill of health on what the allegations were, again, that's not immaterial. Mm. Um, little over, over, overlooked fact. And one, one final thing on that, again, I don't want to go into the Me Too too much, um, but if you if journalists would just look at what's publicly available, it's publicly available. There, there might be a different story told uh, than kind of the majority to story that has been told, um, but it is a Shakespearean story. It's, it's a tragedy, um, you know, and Roger's uh, widow talks about, uh, you know, some of the things in their life and, and regarding yeah. the allegations. So we put that in the film. I think I think that was very fair to put that in there because that would offset uh, anyone's allegations about your film being one-sided. Um, I want to just move on to a couple final points here. Sure. Um, I believe I read that you had a budget of about $200,000 to make this film. The, the film... As far as I can see, again, again, it's mind-boggling how you put so much together, but the film is essentially a very large jigsaw puzzle that you <laughs> made from scratch. So I want to know, how, because I have not seen this anywhere, and I'm bracing myself, is how many hours went into the research, and how long from the very beginning, starting the research, to the very final edit did that take? Was it two years? No, it was, uh, you could say most generously a year and a half, but maybe, you say a year and a half. Okay, well, a year it's, and it's, half. It's, it's, it's not far short of two years. That's a long yeah, time. A year and a half. It, um, again, but there were phases of this. I mean, when you go in and digitize a basement full of tapes and, and media, the haystack, do you count that? Yeah, maybe you count yeah, that. Of course, as you, of course you count yeah. that. It's all, yeah. part, so, it's all part. How many people on your team in total? One, two, three, four. Oh, there's about 10 of us plus post. Well, there's so many ways. Let's call it 10 people on the core. Um, but, but then you had, we had location people. We had post-production, this and that. But it was, we were a pretty small team. Um, that's why it wasn't very expensive. Now, I want to ask you about. Uh, the lady I spoke about earlier, and, and, and forgive me, I, I just want to see if I've got her name down here because I have totally forgotten her name. The South Laura African. L Laura Logan. She, uh, the sound was different with her. I mean, I, I'm really getting dorky and nerdy. Uh, where, was she, where was she located? Where did you record that? This is That's just a, a technical thing. Um, so we shot that in San Diego, and... Little did we know that the it was right outside the Marine base and the United States Marine Corps was conducting littoral operations that day overhead with Osprey. And every five minutes we'd be interrupted oh. by a helicopter. And you know, it was a great two hour interview. She's just laughing. And I realized that's her world. She didn't care. She's been doing war corresponding for 20 years. I'm all freaked out that there's helicopters going over. So it did affect the sound because what the sound engineers had to do to kind of drown out some of that stuff going on. Um, 
you know, live and learn. I'm it, sorry it about a, mentioning that. It was just another day for her. <laughs> I, I just right. thought she, I thought maybe that you'd flown out somewhere exotic to record her, and that maybe you used a, a different no. recording and device. She, and kudos to Laura. She um, she's lovely. She's well, and, and if you go research her. There's another guest you'll have on for 25 hours because she's far more interesting than me and in what she's done with her life. Well, actually, I, I'd rather look at her than you. Uh, nothing <laughs> personal. Um, okay, so let's sum this up here. Uh, we'll, we'll all come away from this film. And I, I want to thank the people who joined us late today. We had a late surge. Uh, and I want to thank the people who are going to be watching us because I know you're on standby on YouTube because we've announced this so uh, to those of you on YouTube and those of you, by the way, just let me point out, as I always do, those of you listening um, on uh, TuneIn Radio, my, my um, time out with Philip Silverstone, which has been on there now for about 12 years. Uh, if you go to my website, thesilverstonecollection.com, photos that we have shown today, links, everything is always on there. Uh, so uh, that's, that's a good place to go. But we, I'm going to show a few photos before we wrap up. I'm going to just ask you this question, and I want to quickly sure. go through some photos that I selected from from uh, the, the media kit that I was sent. Uh, we'll all come away from this film, as I did, uh, with talking points and observations and possibly revised opinions. What would you like us to learn from your film in order for your mission to be accomplished, if indeed there was a mission? I mean, I know that it was... Sure. Uh, something you felt that you needed to do whether or not there's a mission here but what would what would you like us to come out of the uh of away from our tv set or eventually if we go to the movie theaters uh, what do you want us to talk about to think about i uh this is what the team and i all came to be our our common goal but um and it may sound fluffy but it's really what i wanted and we wanted people to take away in the old model where, you know, two people went to a movie or four people went to a movie and went and had drinks afterwards or had dinner. My my goal and hope was that after the watching the movie, people who knew Roger, didn't know him, hated him, loved him or didn't know anything about him would sit and say, wow, I did not know that. And then they would talk about the issues, the history him, politics, and they'd actually just talk about it. I don't care which way they come out, but that it would actually foster people sitting around talking about it. And again, following Johnny Carson saying, I did not know that. Hmm. That's what, if that occurs, my goal is achieved. And that was my goal. And hopefully I achieved it. Well, as, as we say in England, you got one punter here that came <laughs> away with, with, uh, with that let me just show people some of the stuff now firstly when i mentioned at the, at the beginning of the show that you owned uh, a wine i never showed the photo so here's the photo of the <laughs> republic of malibu beach blonde chardonnay um i'm sorry i never got to taste that let's uh, i i let's show them now i want to show roger ailes uh with uh, various people this is a photo of roger ailes he's on the right hand side uh like holding his chin uh, you can see who the president at the time was. It was Richard Nixon and Roger Ailes, as we've discussed in this show, uh, helped him out tremendously. Uh, here is uh, Roger Ailes, a little older, uh, with George Bush Sr. when he was uh, running for president. Uh, here is a man who uh, is even better looking than our guest and who has uh, matured amazingly. I, we didn't touch on this. <laughs> you know who it's going to be. Uh, he matured amazingly, and, and I, you know, if he was running for vice president now, people wouldn't laugh at him, as they did back in the day. That's Dan Quayle, who looks fabulous, and I, I compliment you on the lighting that you put on him because it really did uh, show his eyes and everything. It was beautiful, beautiful uh, shots of him. This is Newt Gingrich. These are all in the these are all in the uh, in the film, uh, and they all got paid uh, five million dollars a piece to be in it. This is Rudy Giuliani. This man we've seen a lot lately, Mitch McConnell. Uh, this is 
Rupert Murdoch, who gave uh, Roger Ailes a huge sum of money to launch Fox and Rudy Giuliani next to him. And to show he went both sides of the aisle, here is, uh, here is uh, Roger Ailes with his young son and the Obamas. Let's see who Eliz let's show Roger L's wife. That's Elizabeth. My guest, ladies and germs, has been Michael Barnes, whose documentary is called Man in the Arena, which you can watch on Apple TV, Amazon Prime Video, and Google Play. And for more information, if those of you that are watching this will have seen it the entire two hours of today's show, almost two hours, it is maninthearena.com. On Facebook, it's Man in the Arena Film. On Twitter, it's Roger Ailes, A-I-L-E-S, Roger Ailes, M-I-T-A, which stands for Man in the Arena. Good plugs? Fantastic. Philip, you're the best. I am going to close today's show, as I opened it, with the trailer for Man in the Arena. So my guest, Michael Barnes, here will be back when his new book comes out. And we'll also be discussing in depth uh, and in a serious show uh, the differences between Annie Green Springs and Thunderbird. Or better yet, I'd like to meet up with you, Michael, when you, you next get to New York City. And we'll have a flight of Yago Sangria vintages. That'll be absolutely fabulous. I'm in. I'm all in. Every chip on the table's in on that. Michael, you have been an absolutely supremely brilliant guest who's kept me here virtually two hours and i've enjoyed every minute of it right thank you very much philip appreciate it and I'll, I'll talk to you in a second but in the meantime ladies and gentlemen i love you all please be safe out there please social distance wear those bloody masks for goodness sake will you and uh because if you don't i i won't have you in the audience next week uh, i'll see you on next week's show it's going to be another movie show i think yes it is another movie show and until the next week have a great week and uh we are going to now well, with the tape on the trailer for Man in the Arena. Love you all. PTFN. <laughs> I tend to think of it as something I've done, which my critics would not have done. If I were to pick the most consequential conservative of the modern era, it would be Roger Ailes. And so he engineers presidencies, and then he engineers the most successful news network ever. What Roger Ailes did was create somewhat of a miracle and it's called Fox News. He was one of the most creative people anywhere in America in the news business. Love to sort of be the agitator. Roger, you are, face it, I mean, to Democrats, you're a good villain. I'm a 28-year-old former ditch digger from Ohio, and they're asking me to produce television for a presidential campaign. When Roger Ailes is on your team, you win. You know, you show me somebody who's getting the kicked out of him by everybody, and my instincts immediately are to get into that fight. People in trouble tend to come to me, and I don't run away from them. I should have died because I didn't. I could risk bigger things. I was violating them flagrantly, and I knew that I'd be a dead man. And it was Charles Manson, and I was staring right into his eyes. Whatever it is, I'll take care of it. So is he the pit bull of American politics? This is an instrumental factor in why they had such hatred for Ailes. If you get into an alley fight, it's going to get ugly. Roger has saved, I think, the First Amendment in America. I didn't always agree with what he was saying about me. On 125th Street Uptown, we say that Roger Ailes was the real deal. And they were in business to put Fox News out of business. Because maybe if you can destroy Roger Ailes, maybe Fox doesn't survive beyond him. So this is all part of a masterful plan. Highly inappropriate sexual references. When she was a Fox reporter about a decade ago. Never, 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 and never. Ten years after the fact, and make you reconstruct lunchtime conversations you had. What? What is this? You know, Stalinism. I've had no opportunity to present my side on this. I am not guilty of the charges. What they called me. It's opinion. What I've done is on the record.